It was so unexpected. You had to be there. Coupling Celtic at that time was a brilliant thing. The atmosphere at Parkhead was always great. You had to be there. Nobody ever talks about this game. Nobody saw it. Uh, you had to be there. Mm, delighted to say our guest this week is uh, Carl Dennehy. Carl, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. Very good, Jer. Um, your list is absolutely sensational. You've been to some good stuff. I have, thankfully, yeah, across sports. Obviously, it's heavily athletics uh, slanted, but uh, in, in a fan capacity, I suppose, I've got to some other good stuff, and that tends to be how whatever money I earn writing about athletics, I tend to blow it by uh, going to watch other sport with friends and family and things like that. Uh, apart from athletics, because um, I guess sometimes it might feel like a busman's holiday, what other sports do you like going to? Pretty much anything. I mean, I love horse racing. I've been to Cheltenham a few times. I've been loved tennis. Been to the French Open. Been to the US Open there. Um, never been to golf. Been to a good bit of soccer and rugby. And as a Limerick man, I've obviously been to my fair share of hurling heartbreak down through the years. And of course, uh, lots of rugby games. So, yeah, they're they're the typical. But uh, you know, I'd watch two slugs race up a wall happily. Where are we going to start with your list? Where do you want to start? What's what's number one for you here? I think we'll start with the Tokyo Olympics 2020, well, 2020, but it happened obviously in 2021, and uh, Karsten Warholm's 400-meter uh, hurdles world record. Um, I was talking to a friend earlier in the year, and this probably says a lot about how sad my life is, but I said there's only three times in my life I've been actually, I can remember at least being absolutely speechless. One was when I was looking at the Grand Canyon. One was when I was looking at Iguazu Falls for the first time. And then the third one was when Karsten Warholm went across the line in the 400 meter hurdles final and 45.94 flashed up on the screen. And it was just absolutely a time that was just absolutely unbelievable. And unfortunately, there were no fans there in that Tokyo Olympic Stadium, but the few hundred journalists and team members and everyone there, it was just it was the same reaction all around. It was just speechless. It was just no one knew what to say because this was a time that kind of didn't make sense to anyone, but it was, you know, to, to many of our minds, the greatest race in Olympic history. I remember we had you on, I think, OTB AM that morning, actually a few hours after that run. And I think it had just completely transcended um, the sport even that day. Everybody who had kind of been up in the middle of the night maybe to, to watch the Irish athletes. Was there maybe rowing on that night or something? There was definitely a reason uh, why there was uh, Irish people up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden this thing was on TV and it was like, holy crap, this is absolutely bonkers. Even like Ry Benjamin and his time uh, coming in in second place was just uh, astonishing as well. Like, what was this potentially... Like, where does this rank in terms of the, the greatest races or the greatest finals on an Olympics track? I mean, I think it's, I think it's probably number one, and I think what makes it probably number one. I mean, individually, obviously, we've had incredible performances. You've Usain Bolt's uh, world record to win in Beijing. I think what was that nine sixty nine? He ran celebrating early. Um, obviously, you've the Jesse Owens, you've the Bob Beamans, um, you know, his long term back in 1968. But a lot of those great Olympic performances were individual brilliance. I think what made this race special was that it was actually a competitive race. Still, the last 20 meters, people didn't really know who was going to win. And you had two, not just one athlete, but two athletes going where no other athlete had gone before. Um, the world record at that time, until that summer, it was 46, 78. And then Warholm, as many kind of had expected him to do at some point, carved it down to 46, 70. And that's kind of, you know, the normal world record jump, like less than a tenth of a second in a one lap race. No one, just absolutely no one. Everyone thought, yeah, maybe the world record could go in Tokyo, but it was, like I said, 46, 70. I don't know anyone who thought they'd see 45 flash up on the screen. And then to see that Ry Benjamin finished second, I think he was 46.1 something, you know, still more than half a second under the world record. Um, and someone, Ry Benjamin gave one of the great quotes after that. They said, what would you have said to someone if you would or dad told you before the race that you were going to run 46-1 and lose and he said I would have probably punched him in the face and told <laughs> him to get out of the room um, and that I think summed it up you know in terms of you can uh, beat everyone else in history by such an astonishing margin but if there's one guy who goes where no one else has gone you end up with the silver medal and poor Ray Benjamin was devastated with that but yeah it was just just one of those in athletics history i can never remember a race that good where two men two men have just completely gone beyond what anyone thought possible and did it together on the same day the same track the fact that there's nobody there as well like it's so weird that 
you know, we lived through such a weird period where we were talking about this earlier. There was football on every night and, uh, you know, it was discombobulating. But this is an Olympic Games and everybody's so happy, I think, that there's something for us to watch and that these athletes are going to get the opportunity a year later to to do their thing. But, like, so much controversy in Japan about whether or not the Olympics should go ahead as well. So all of that kind of feeds into this backdrop. What's the actual pre-race atmosphere like? Do you remember, like, is, is, there, is there tension is everybody kind of aware that we're about to see something momentous, or I, I, do, do you have any recollection of that at all? I kind of, I can, I can just remember from the journalist point of view, just being exhausted and kind of almost going there, knowing right this could be big, but kind of thinking, oh, I think it was like it was probably around the Wednesday, the second week, obviously at Olympics. So you're talking maybe 12, 13 days into the games, like a twenty day games. So kind of everyone, fans, spectators, whatever, was kind of like suffering a bit of Olympics fatigue at that point. And I remember it was a morning session. Um, so obviously you're still shaking off the grogginess and you're getting to the stadium and like, oh, then there wasn't really anything big else on that morning. So that was kind of the only show in town. But I just remember, yeah, you know, nothing at the Olympics kind of felt like an Olympics because you're used to that atmosphere, you're used to that kind of rumble and the crackle of anticipation going around the stadium as a Many of the other events I suppose I'll be talking about showed, but that morning it was just eerie silence, but obviously you knew this was the big show. Um, and then afterwards I remember like, you know, even though there were some people cheering, even some of the journalists were probably not being journalists and cheering along as the race happened, but then afterwards just that complete disbelief going around the stadium with the few hundred who were there. And I remember my friend Phelan Kelly, who was an Irish team coach, was over in the back straight in the athlete section watching and he just, he, Warholm was obviously doing his, those weird laps of honour where, with his flag, where there was no one actually there to salute. But he was just going down the back straight in silence, you know, waving at the handful of people. And Phelan just ran down to the edge and he just shouted at Warholm. He's like, man, that is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And Warholm just kind of smiled at him and said, well, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, so it was funny to, to get those little interactions among the few. And I think really as a journalist, it was one of those moments where you're like, you know, there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, millions perhaps even around the world watching this who would love to have said they were there to witness this. The athletics nerds like myself especially. Um, and to kind of have been there, you really did walk away going, wow, I was so, so lucky to have seen that in the flesh. Mm -hmm. I think he did a, an interview on, on um, with, with David Gillick actually straight away after. Like, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm mistaken on that one. So is it like more of an intimate Olympic Games than, than ever before like with regards to access even though that doesn't make any sense because there was still the world media there but did you find that you got more insights than you usually would have got at an Olympic Games last year in Tokyo? For sure yeah um, like I went to I remember going to gymnastics with one of my friends Gerard O'Donnell who was again working with the Irish team and we went to the women's all round gymnastics final and again no crowds there a good few team members obviously showing up but obviously you'd normally have several thousand screaming fans and we just sat down towards like the VIP section, like probably two rows from the front. And we were kind of laughing at each other going like, you know, we know relatively nothing about gymnastics. And we we're saying there's, there's gymnastics fans around the world and who would probably pay 10 grand to be in these seats, like front row to watch Simone Biles take on the Russians and all that, like, you know, the very best of the best of all time. Um, and then it was fascinating just hearing the cheers, I think, things you couldn't normally hear when you're even there in a journalist capacity, even if you've really good seats. And I remember going to the basketball, I watched USA France in the basketball, and that really stood out in terms of a different experience because I'd been to maybe five or six NBA games when I'd been over in the States. And obviously, even when you get down in good seats, you just the noise is too much that you can't really hear the team talking to each other. But I remember being three rows from the front and there have been about 50 people in the arena when I was watching USA play France. This was in the, this wasn't the final. More people obviously went to the final, but in the kind of group stages of the Olympic tournament and just hearing all the different calls, how much trash the players were talking to each other, how much of a, a pain in the neck Draymond Green was um, to everyone else, just like he'd swat a ball away then he'd just be like, get that shit out of here. And um, just things like that, things you probably... You can see they're talking trash on TV, but then when you hear it up front, and then I suppose the physicality of it as well, what stood out to me at the basketball in terms of just the, the absolute whacks and the, the crunch of the players' bodies as they would hit the ground after, you know, swatting a ball away or something like that. Um, so, yeah, it was a, it was a, actually like, while obviously 99% of it was worse because you love that atmosphere, there was that little bits where you're like, oh, I've never heard, you know, Steve Kerr kind of, 
make these calls before. And I never heard that as the shot clock is counting down, everyone on the bench is, is counting so the player is aware of it, which is something, despite watching basketball for years, I'd never realised. And so there was a lot of kind of, I suppose, been athletics my whole life. There wasn't too much in that that was new to me, but watching the other sports, they're the can- lack of crowds. They're counting out loud. You can, he- you can hear them counting out loud, can you? Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that either. As the, as, right. as the shot clock gets down to like five, all the bench and the coach were just like, five, four, three. Right. So the player is aware of it, which is something I didn't know before. Right, okay. Uh, Leo Messi's next. Um, wh- what what have you picked for Leo Messi? This is against Deportivo Alaves. Yeah, it's a random one. It's certainly not, not one that will make the top 50 probably highlights of Leo Messi's career, but I suppose it is you had to be there and this is the one time in my life that I was there for Leo Messi. Um... I suppose I'll tell a bit of the story behind this. I went to Barcelona in September 2019 on a holiday with a friend and we were just there. And I think the season hadn't quite started. Maybe it was August. But we said we must come back to this great city and go to a game. And we said... So I kind of rounded up basically a group of lads in the WhatsApp group over the couple of months that followed and said, lads, come on, we need to go see Messi. You know, he's into his 30s. Who, no- who knows how much longer we're going to be able to see him? And he said, we have to tick this box. So we called it Project Messi. So five of us went over for a weekend just before Christmas, stayed in a great hostel and uh, went on the lash over in Barcelona. But we went to watch, deeply hungover, we went to watch Barcelona play Deportivo Alaves and just a standard La Liga game, Sunday afternoon. Um, and, you know, tickets were like 50, 60 euro. And we all just said, we've said for two years now, three years, we said that was the best money we've ever spent because... Um, yeah, just watching him in the flesh, like we'd obviously all watched him for so many years, hundreds of times on TV, but actually being there, it, it showed to me what a different experience it can be watching live sport because obviously there wasn't too much other talent. Luis Suarez was playing, I think, as well, but we were all just watching Messi most of the game and watching what he did. And what stood out to me was just how lazy he was on the pitch. You know, he he stood still when other players were walking. He walked when other players were jogging and he jogged when other players were sprinting. And he kind of just would drift out of the game for like 10 minute periods and just be kind of standing on the sideline, just watching things. And you're like, if this was anyone but Lionel Messi, the coach would be roaring at him that he's a lazy fecker. Like, but when it is Messi, um, obviously he springs to life when it matters most. And it was 2-1, probably, I think it must have been 70, 75 minutes into the game. And Messi just picks up this ball. Again, having been doing nothing for a while, but he picks up this ball maybe 35, 40 yards out. There's two def- defenders straight in front of him. There's one right beside him, like stuck to him to his right. And then there's one more, probably two or three metres to the left. And obviously I've had to watch this on YouTube before I came on today to remember that goal. Um, and then just in a position that other players... 99.9% of the players would not find the space to shoot or find an outlet to get out of that situation. He just saw the little space, the two meter gap to his left, just moved the ball one meter to his left and then just out of nowhere, just unleashed his shot from probably well outside the box and bang, in it goes. And I remember just being up in the stands with the lads and we were like, wow, you know, in terms of, it wasn't an especially great game for Messi until that point, but then it was like 2-1 to 3-1. And all of us just, just went, yeah, that was that was worth the the trek over here, and that was that that illustrated perfectly, I suppose, the greatness of Lionel Messi, where it was like something a player no one else could do, and just one moment of magic made it all worthwhile. I think people are probably still going to make the trip to Paris this year to see him in a run of the mill game. You just want to be guaranteed that he's going to play, because as you say, the opportunities for this for people now to go and say, I saw Leo Messi play, are getting smaller and smaller. They're telescoping pretty quickly. Um, I've just watched the goal on YouTube as well. It's kind of, um, it is one of those, like Messi's greatness, I think, was the, the thing that inspired everybody was when he was able to dribble past five or six players from inside his own. And it was like, wow, nobody can do this. But they're the goals that helped him rack up 30, 35, 40, 45 goals a season where it's like he's shooting and you don't expect him to shoot and all of a sudden the ball's past the keeper like that. So that's a very good one. Um, Usain Bolt, was there a list in your head where Usain Bolt wasn't going to be on the list? (laughs) No, it had to be. Um, Yeah, I'd seen Bolt. When had I seen him? I missed his obviously greatest year, I suppose, 2009, 2010, or 2008, 2009 Olympics and World Championships when he was at his absolute peak. And then I started kind of getting into the journalism game around kind of 2013, 2012. And um, so I was there for his world 
championships in 2013, 2015, 2017, and obviously I'd seen them at some other events as well in the intervening years and stuff. Um, and I think I picked out this one because this was probably one of the best sporting events I'd been to. Um, now, obviously, everyone in the career bolt will remember the Beijing Olympics and the Ber Berlin World Championships, the world records, the, the when he was at his peak. But if there is a race to me that sums up the greatness of Usain Bolt, it's 2015 in Beijing. And, you know, it's the classic cliche of uh, the definition of a good team is winning when they're not at their best. And this was Bolt winning when he wasn't at his best. He was in shocking form all year. He'd been riddled with injuries. And Justin Gatlin had come back and he was like 34 years old, I think, 33, 34 at the time, and was just running unbelievably all year. Um he was running like 9.74 and Bolt looked like he was struggling to break, you know, 9.95. But he was kind of slowly creeping forward with his form and obviously everyone knew Bolt, if he gets back, you know, he's a freak. He, he might just pull this off. But going into that World Championships, I mean, everyone thought this is Gatlin's year. Surely this is Gatlin's year, the form he's in, the form Bolt is in. And Gatlin dominated the heats, absolutely crushed the semi-final, easing up. But I remember... A friend had said to me, who works in athletics and, and athletes manager from the Netherlands, he'd said to me, he was like, in this final in Beijing, he was like, you, Justin Gatlin is going to experience something he's never experienced all year. And that's just the idea and the feeling of Usain Bolt running him down. Um, and obviously, tightness is the biggest enemy for a sprinter. You know, you run your fa fastest when you're relaxed. And all year, Gatlin had been relaxed and killing it, basically. But then for the first time all year, this was the first time he met Usain Bolt, he probably psychologically knew, even if I'm in front by two metres and 50 metres, this guy is coming. And it happened textbook like that. Gatlin got out. He was running his perfect race up to 50 metres. But Bolt had some, was just producing not his A-grade effort. It was a B-level race for Usain Bolt. He ran 9.79, you know, which is obviously not that quick for a guy who's run 9.5. But 50 metres on, there came Usain Bolt just creeping towards Gatlin. And what it led to was Gatlin tightening up. And if you watch the race from like 20 metres out, Gatlin maybe has half a metre at that point. All he has to do is maintain his form, stay upright and time his dip for the finish. But what happens He's terrified by that thought of Usain Bolt coming at him, which he was, and he starts straining, leaning forward to the line, and that completely kills his momentum. And then once they get to the finish, it's 9.79 for Bolt, and then one hundredth of a second he beat Gatlin by. And I just remember being in the stadium, that was one of the first times where I kind of experienced the true magic of the 100 metres, which is just that the silence before the gun is just such a cool moment. I suppose in rugby terms, it's like that eerie, home and park conversion silence and um, it's just so strange but to see it with you know 60,000 people in Beijing and just everyone just waiting for this explosive 9.8 second race um, it was something to behold Did the 100 come before the 200 because they obviously they go up against each other in both those races uh, in uh, that championships yeah, yeah, the 100 is always first yeah, yeah so that was it yeah and it was just I think it was you know I suppose I always think the the hero versus villain thing is always overplayed, you know, like just because Gatlin has tested positive, he's like a, a demon and because Bolt hasn't, he's, you know, he's an angel, this sort of thing. And you could, that narrative was a bit tiring at the time and a bit kind of like, hmm, you know, how are you so sure about everything here and sort of way. But at the same time, it was kind of, it was, you know, there was no one, even personality wise, there was very few people in that stadium or around the athletics world who were watching that race who didn't want Usain Bolt to win. Um, and the fact he did it against such ridiculously stacked odds, he was clearly not in as good a shape as Justin Gatlin, but he, he found a way to win when not at his best, which I suppose is the, which made him the greatest of all time. Okay, so uh, you, you made a reference to the heartbreak years that uh, being a Limerick man has um, inflicted on you for such a long period and, you know, we'd probably be having not going to bit a crack out of that if you were, say, a Mayo football fan right now. But it turns out things turned um, and, uh, you know, no one has any sympathy for those heartbreak years that you suffered anymore because you actually are a fan of one of the greatest teams of all time, it turns out. But we didn't know that at the time and I think their breakthrough win is your is your next on the list. Is that right? That's right, 2018 All-Ireland win. And um, I suppose we're picking out individual moments of brilliance as well here. And I think what stands out to me with this game is that, 
you know, you think of most All Irelands and everyone kind of thinks of a score, like a goal, a point, something like that. But I think what stands out to me anyway, and I'm sure a lot of Limerick people, was not any particular score. Obviously, it, you know, there were great scores in that game, but what stood out to me was the catch. You know, it was Tom Condon's catch. I think it was seven, there was a lot of injury time. I think it was maybe 77, 78 minutes into the game. And Limerick are one point ahead and Joe Canning gets a free, you know, what was it, maybe 80 yards plus from goal. It was way out. It was one of those kind of 50-50 frees. Is he going to make this or not to tie the game? And every Limerick person in the stands was just breaking it, you know, being like, oh, here we go again. They're going to tie it up. They're going to win. It's going to happen again, which is what the mentality of Limerick people was for my whole life anyway to that point. And um, then the ball dropped short and it's Tom and everyone is like oh god and you know almost when it's dropping short people are like this is all probably worse because now someone could pull on it some Galway player is going to catch it and stick it in the net and hello it's 1994 once again and Limerick people go home devastated but then Tom Condon just attacked the ball caught the ball a couple of players around him just burst through them ripped out of the fence and I think he got a hand pass off to someone and then the ball was cleared and then bang ref blows it up and Limerick go wild and I think the story of that, yeah, and that's that's my abiding memory of that game and just the relief washing around that stadium and then the cranberries blaring out around Crow Park. Um, and to, to be Tom Condon, you know, I sat down with him about, or I talked to him on the phone, it was for an interview maybe a month later. Um, and, you know, he came from Nakaderi, a village of like 1,500 people. They'd never won in All-Ireland before. He was the most unlikely hero, I suppose, from Limerick that you could pick out. He'd been sent off. Limerick had won blot that year. They were hammered by Clare. Uh, during the Munster Championship. Tom Condon had been sent off by that. And Tom Condon spoke about that red card and how his teammates all started calling him Zinedine Zidane after that <laughs> um, for the year. But he actually kind of, you know, it was a fun, obviously, but he obviously kind of took that red card to heart. But he, he kind of thought, John Kiley's not going to give me another chance here. I've kind of blown it for him in terms of my temperament and things like that. And then I think it was Richie English got injured in well into well beyond the 70th minute um, in that game. And then off the bench comes Tom Condon. Didn't really do much in the six minutes between that. But then what a moment to step up and to become like the most unlikely hero for, for Limerick's historic win. And I do think that kind of, you know, if that point went over or if some other player had caught it and stuck it in the net, I think we could be looking at it as great as this Limerick team are. I think the current generation might have been scarred the way so many Limerick people and players were by that 94 loss to Offaly. Yeah, Carl, that's great stuff. Last one here is the sub two hour marathon in Vienna in 2019. I presume you were there for work. Yeah, I was there for work and uh, I was kind of floating around the course. Obviously, you know, there's not much you can write during the race. This guy is just continuing to run 434 per mile or 250 per kilometer. So I was kind of floating around. And one thing they had at that sub two hour marathon attempt was a treadmill set up. Uh, beside the course whereby people could run at the pace Kipchoge was running, which is 159 marathon pace. So I hopped on it for the crack and ran it for two minutes before I was absolutely dying of death and fell off the treadmill um, during the race. But yeah, there was like such crowds in the end of that morning. And it was like, I was kind of skeptical about the attempt because, you know, they weren't following all the rules in terms of they were handing them drinks off a bike rather than pick them off a table, you know, and they had a team of pacemakers rotating. So it wasn't going to count as an official world record, but obviously they had to do those things just to give him the shot at sub two. And he absolutely smashed it, you know, I mean, went obviously 18 seconds under the sub two marathon and the crowds were just going wild. And it was in essence, a kind of a boring thing, like just one man running at the same pace and Kenny hold on. But in another way, it was the most thrilling thing because it was like just a man, despite all the stuff, you know, Ineos, whatever, they're, uh, you know, fracking and they have a, a terrible environmental record. And when they're a sponsor, you're kind of like a bit queasy about the event in terms of it is sports washing, essentially. But at its heart was this lovely guy, Elliot Kipchoge, a modest guy from the Highlands of Kenya, going where no man had ever gone before and just to have seen that in the flesh and to seen the kind of it felt at the finish line like not just this is cheesy but not just a celebration for Kipchoge it was kind of like a celebration for humanity in terms of yes they didn't follow some of the smaller rules but at its heart this was a man running around a flat course at 434 per mile for 26.2 miles and that was just much like Warhol that was just something that for so long in our lives seemed impossible but then he did it okay Carl, that's great stuff. That is a brilliant episode of You Had to Be There. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers.